Welcome to Marvin Methodist Church's Sanctuary Service. My name is Doug Baker and I'm the lead pastor. Today, we continue a sermon series entitled Biblical Conjunctions. I'll be addressing the enemy of the soul, the flesh. Those who are governed by the flesh cannot please God, but you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the spirit. Let's join in as the message is already underway. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, that even through the body, as though the body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the Spirit who lives in you. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Thank you, Kara and Levi, for that wonderful music. Thank you for being here today as we continue our sermon series on biblical conjunctions. Today, you, however... Such a contrast to the first part of the Scripture, the you, however, flips this script, and we learn about life in the Spirit. Let us pray. Lord God, in these moments, as Your Word is proclaimed, hide me now behind the cross. May Your Holy Spirit be welcome here, not only to speak through me, but to speak into all of our hearts that we might hear from You this morning. Lord, where we are comfortable, maybe make us uncomfortable. Where we need to change, Lord, do a good work in us. Inspire us, renew us, we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Kabosh. That is the Hebrew word meaning to subdue. It's found many times throughout the Old Testament, usually having to do with subduing an enemy that has been uh, beaten. I feel like when I say the word kabosh, It ought to be one of those words that pops up on the screen during one of those fight scenes with Batman, right? (laughs) Bam, wham, kapow, kabosh. But I think what Micah is doing as he uses it in Micah 7, verse 19, is what I want us to focus on today. You will again have compassion on us, Lord, and you will kabosh, you will subdue our sins, and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Micah was having a vision of what was to come through the power, the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ and His resurrection, and also through the coming power of the Holy Spirit to be alive and well in every believer's heart, to subdue the desires of the flesh that we might live for God. So as we continue our sermon series on biblical conjunctions, you, however, listen to these words, those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God is at work in you. What is the hardest thing to conquer in this life? It is not national enemies or terrorism. It is not the devastation which we've seen on our television screens in Hawaii of all of the wildfires there, or even battling disease like cancer or other debilitating diseases. The hardest challenge that you or I will face in this life is to conquer oneself. In the words of Proverbs 16:32, it's harder to conquer yourself than to conquer a city. As we continue again this series, you, however, we will be focusing on the work of the Holy Spirit in us as we take on today one of the three enemies of the soul or of the spiritual life, 
the enemy known as the flesh. Now, flesh is a very interesting word. In modern day language, as word meanings shift and change through time, most commonly today, if you were to look up the word flesh, you would find a definition, something looking like our skin. I have a flesh wound. Or you might find it to mean something like the entire body. He was there in the flesh. But friends, in New Testament times, the Greek word, sarx, flesh, was loaded with a lot of meaning, and a lot of it was negative meaning. And if you've been a studier of the Bible through the years, you have picked up on this. And so that is what we're going to be focusing on today. And the NIV translation, which came out of 2011, has kind of softened up this reading, talking about the realm of the flesh and the realm of the spirit. I want to let you know that back in 1984, the NIV, and in your pew Bibles today, it does not speak of the realm of, it just says, you who are in the flesh cannot please God, and you who are in the spirit, you know, will find this conquering of the flesh. Biblical translator Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message, defines the flesh as this, the corruption that sin has introduced into our very appetites and our instincts. John Mark Comer, in his book, Live No Lies, which I have told you last week and will tell you each week, is the inspiration behind this sermon series, speaks about the Christian worldview and our understanding of the flesh. Our base, primal, animalistic desires for self-gratification, especially pertaining to sensuality, as in sexuality and the use of food, but also pleasure in general, as well as instincts for survival, dominion, and get this, the need we might have to control things. There are desires in all of us And even though modern humanistic thinking will tell us, you are good, you do you, you find what makes you happy, I'm here to share with you, and I don't know if you would also agree with me, I have desires that are not pure. I have desires that I am not pleased about. I have this dark side also that I try to fight. Anybody want to say amen to that with me? This idea in our human culture today that you just do you, everything is great, you do what makes you happy, is not really true. I believe it to be one of the lies of the devil. And it is leading many people astray and leading many people away from Christ, away from a life with God and a life with the church. The desires are in all of us. But the Bible's passages are very clear and have been clear throughout all the centuries. There is a dark underbelly of the human heart that must be subdued by the power of God. Theologically, we call this word depravity, the human condition that plagues us all. And because of this depravity, because of the dark side of the heart, I need a savior. Anybody else want to raise your hand and say, I need a Savior as well? Not only that, friends, but in the Methodist Church, in our Wesleyan theology, we need the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to continue to do a good work in us because we are still under construction. We are still working out our salvation. The Bible concept is very clear. The struggle with the flesh is very real. And I should not be surprised, but in our post-Christian thinking America, we tend to think about this idea of you do you, and we push away this understanding that flesh is bad. But flesh, flesh is both bad and good. And as we'll see at the end of the message today, it is through the flesh that you practice your faith. It is through the flesh that you practice reading the Scripture and making time to serve others. And we celebrated last week that Jesus came in the flesh. The flesh is a good thing when it's honoring and serving God and aligning itself with God's purposes. But the flesh also has that dark underbelly. Now, this dualistic thinking of humans is nothing new. It's not something that we have just had in the Christian tradition. 
Greek philosopher Plato illustrated the struggle with the flesh by using a word picture of a chariot driver with two horses harnessed together, each fighting for domination. One horse called the lover of honor and modesty and self-control, and the other was a companion to wild boasts and indecency, deaf as a post, but barely yielding to the horsewhip. What a beautiful description, Plato. Thank you so much for that. Jewish rabbi also spoke of two souls warring within each other. There, these are called the animal soul and the divine soul as the Jewish faith has spoken into this complex discussion of duality of humanity. And even American spirituality tells a story of two wolves that live inside every person. One is evil, the other is good. One, the one that will prevail is the one that the person feeds. The point is this, we are in a battle we are in a battle. Don't let anyone tell you that you can decide what's right or wrong because, friends, we get confused. Our feelings can mislead us, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. We need Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to guide us in and out of this battle. As I begin to unpack this, I want to share with you the trifecta of a person's thinking, feeling, and desire is the heart. That is how the mind and the emotions and the will are all connected. That's why I believe we talk about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Henry Nouwen in his book called The Way of the Heart says the heart is the seat of the will. It determines the personality. Therefore, it also places, it is also the place where God dwells and also the place where Satan directs his fiercest attacks. In the evangelical church, of which the Methodist church is a part, we talk about the importance of surrendering one's heart to the lordship of Jesus Christ because we need to subject ourselves to put Christ on the throne. We must die to ourselves so that Christ may live in us. In verse 5 of the Scripture, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Quick check would be to look at the, the fruits of the Spirit from Galatians 5.22. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things which the Holy Spirit desires for you. But I want to come back to this idea about the mind. Those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the Spirit and bring in some thinking here from St. Augustine. Again, Here's the question I want to raise in our thoughts and minds today. Are you seeking to live according to the flesh? Or are you seeking to live according to God's Holy Spirit? We're going to come at this three different ways. Through the lens of St. Augustine's way of thinking, through Paul's list of what I call sour fruits of Romans 8 and Galatians 5, and also from some introspective questions I have to offer you. First of all, let me speak of St. Augustine. St. Augustine made a great contribution with his thoughts that we are first lovers and then we are thinkers. We live from desire and feelings. We've been created in love, and that's why love drives us. But we must also engage our minds because sometimes we love the wrong things. And sometimes the things that we love need to be reprioritized because they are out of order. This is St. Augustine's greatest contribution to theology. A person could say, I love my job. I love going to work every day. I, I get great fulfillment there. I help a lot of people. I make a lot of money for my family. But if the love of your job comes before the love of your family and you direct all your energy, time, and resources and neglect the family and neglect the children, friends, you're gonna get a wake-up call someday because there may be a divorce in your future. There may be estranged children that don't know the love of their mother or their father because because you have been out of order. So I think there's some wisdom to St. Augustine's thinking here. 
And let me say also to our young parents in the church today, we may prioritize and think that uh, everything's about sports and extracurricular activities at the expense maybe of our children's faith. We don't bring them to church because athletic competitions are now on Sunday. We make that decision and we wake up one day and our child goes off to college and has no faith background. Friends, there comes time when we must step back and think about where we are going and think about reprioritizing. That is one way to handle the battle of the flesh and focusing on what the Spirit desires. A second way, which I don't recommend, is simply to go all in, all in with the flesh. Don't ever say no to anything. Try everything. Be like the prodigal son. Take the father's wealth and just go for it. Don't waste any time debating about whether there's a moral decision to make. Just figure it out as you go and see how your life ends up. We can gratify the cravings of the flesh, follow its desires, choose not to employ the spiritual practice of self-denial, but instead do whatever we want whenever we want to do it. The result may be similar to what St. Augustine found before his conversion. For nine years, as he served in the army, he had a playful life, lots of activities, lots of experiences that his praying mother was sad about as she prayed for him. But while outdoors one day, he heard a children's song, pick it up and read it, pick it up and read it. He thought it was a, some kind of a message or a song from a child, and there was some kind of game he was supposed to pick up and read, but then he came across a Bible He read from that Bible, as it said, to pick up and read it, and this is what he read from Romans 13, 13 and 14. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual excess or lust, not in quarreling or jealousy, rather put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. St. Augustine heard those words, and his life was changed forever. And his theology began to be such a great contribution as he is still quoted thousands thousands of years later because of his great work and because of God's good work in him. To pursue everything, friends, is to go into a, a state of rebellion against God. Theology becomes just therapy, something that might help me out or give me some guidance. Biblical interest in righteousness replaced by the search for happiness. And let me, know, let me tell you this, if you can probably ask anybody in this room, whatever you think will make you happy will eventually disappoint you until you try something else that will try to make you happy. And you'll continue to go through disillusionment. Christ knows what makes us happy. And when we come through faith in Christ, we come through the door of his sacrificial death. We declare that we are a sinner in need of his forgiveness and his imputed righteousness because of his death on the cross becomes our righteousness. And by his righteousness, we are made clean. And through that relationship with God, we begin to redirect our appetites and our thoughts. The good life is not getting what I want. With Christ in you, we truly want good things. Our scripture lesson today also spoke of death, hostility towards God, inability to submit to God's law, inability to please God. Friends, that is the poor fruit of choosing poorly and denying one's God-created space for Christ to come and dwell. Another option is to just take a test. Open up your Bibles to Galatians 5, 19 through 21, and before the fruits of the Spirit, you'll see the fruits of the flesh. Can I list them for you? Sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, envy, drunkenness. I hear so much of people who get on Facebook and social media and end up with this envious feeling towards their friends as they covet their neighbors and their friends' experiences. And I don't know about drunkenness, but hey, Maybe somebody out here today is, cannot get to sleep each night without having to take a drink to take the edge off. Or is there a fit of rage that, that you're struggling with or jealousy or, or some, some unresolved grudge that you are holding? Go through the checklist. And if any of those are applying to you, it may be time for you to say no to the flesh and begin to try to walk better with the Spirit. 
So here are some introspective type questions I want to offer to you. Asking yourself this question, how am I doing in my self-discipline? How am I doing in being able to tell my body what I want to do? Or is the flesh controlling me? Are you staying up on your biblical re Bible reading? How are you doing in your fitness goals? I'll share with you about two weeks ago, I said to Jacob Joyner, you know, the big guy, the big pastor around here, and uh, I said to him, you know, I'm going to be seeing my son at the end of August, and, you know, he lifts weights, and we're going to be doing some pretty athletic stuff, and I don't want to be embarrassed, so could you uh, meet with me down in the gym and uh, show me some ways to lift some weights, do some resistance training so I can get a little strength before I see him? Friends, that was two weeks ago, and it still hasn't happened. <laughs> And it's not Jacob's fault, but I can just tell you, we all have ambitions, we all have desires, we all want to look good and feel good, but oftentimes it comes to, do we, can we get our bodies to do what we want to do? I've wanted to drop a few pounds, but I've had some hard weeks here at the office lately. I work long hours, I get home, I plop down on the sofa, I have that second bowl of ice cream, and I can tell you, friends, the sugar fix is not the same as a prayer fix. The sugar fix is not the same as just going to bed early, but it's what we're drawn to. It's what the flesh tells us we need to do. And so, friends, don't always listen to the flesh. Here are some other questions for you. Is there anything that I'm keeping a secret from others? Is there anything that is taking control over my life? Is there any unconfessed sin that I need to confess to others? These are not the questions for the faint at heart. These are the questions for those who want a serious walk with Jesus Christ. These are the people who really want a serious call to sanctification in their life. And if you cannot answer those questions or if you duck those questions, friends, you might be walking in the, in the flesh more than you are in the spirit. Well, you might be thinking, well, Doug, all I need right now is a little bit of more better willpower. But let me tell you this, I love the admonition of the scripture. Here is the scripture we focused on. The way that we fight the flesh and the wind is not through willpower, but through the Spirit's power. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you, however, are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit. And one of the keys to first, for spiritual formation is this. In order to have change, that you desire, it's not about trying harder, friends. It's about practicing the spiritual practices that have been handed down through the centuries in the church, the practices of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's where I want to end this message today, to talk briefly about those practices, because the Spirit's power is released when you practice the spiritual practices. Change what you can control, our habits, to influence what we can't control, the flesh. And there, in those practices, you'll be open to the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit will begin to close off some of the influence of the flesh. Let's talk about self-denial. It's okay to say no to things. It's okay to say no to an overcrammed schedule. It's okay to say no to your cell phone. Leave it on the, on the nightstand. Uh, leave it in the other room for a couple hours. You don't have to always be on call, respond to everything that everybody needs. You can say no to R-rated movies. I've said no to R-rated movies forever, but I tell you this, I wrote a paper in high school on the atomic bomb. So when the movie Oppenheimer came out, I said, you know, I wanna see that. I'm sorry I saw it. I love the interaction, I love the backstory that I learned about, but the nudity was offensive. And I'm, I'm embarrassed and ashamed that our country cannot produce a historical movie without that kind of material in it. And so I'm just saying, uh, say no to things you need to say no to. Along those lines, there's the, the idea of spiritual fasting. This has become kind of a little bit of a joke for me because of what happened with our disaffiliation vote. I will say to you, if you fast, hydrate yourself. For five years, I fasted successfully without having an incident. I just made the big show on the big night. But let me just say this. If you fast, and I and encourage you to do it because Christians have fasted for centuries. Sometimes Christians have fasted twice a week. 
But friends, the best thing about fasting is, well, there are two things. First of all, saying no to yourself is a way to discipline yourself and to train yourself that you can say no to things by your control, and saying no to food is a good way to do that. Fasting trains our bodies to not get what they want. And guess what? Sometimes, somewhere, in a conversation or in some happening in life, you will not get what you want, but you will have practiced for it. You will have trained for it through fasting. And so you don't have to go off, off, off irate. You don't have to respond negatively because your body will have been trained to say no to certain things or to be told no. Fasting also reveals how we misuse food for comfort. I've already kind of revealed to you. I will confess, I use sugar treats and candy and especially peanut M&Ms <laughs> to deal with emotional things at times. Gina will tell you, if a bag of M&Ms, a big bag, a family size share bag comes into the house, it doesn't have a chance. It may be gone in two days. I'm just telling you, that's a good way to understand the way we use food and the fasting. If you tell yourself no on food, that is how you will learn what has a hold on you. Confession, holy conferencing, James 5.16 says, confess your sins to each other, pray for each other so that you may be healed. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Life Together states, sin demands to have a person by themselves. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of the sin over them. Sin wants to remain unknown. It shuns the light, and in the darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole person of the, of the being. You need to be in a group, friends. And let me just say this. We've got enlistment going on for uh, bands and class meetings. There are different ways you can connect with different people in this church and have mutual accountability where you can confess your sins. We've got confession, self-denial, and fasting. And let me just lastly say scripture reading. We are more susceptible to the spiritual defeat when we are neglecting the Word of God. I remind you, the writer of Ephesians describes the sword of the Spirit as the Word of God. I want you to get this image in your mind. When you stop reading the Word of God, you take the sword out of the Spirit's hand. And the sword, the instrument by which He uses to change you and to cut away the things that are necessary has been removed. You must be reading the Word of God. Stopping that limits the Spirit's work in you. Let me say this in closing. Most important, save for last, verse 11. The Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. If you feel like you are overwhelmed, you're out of control, your flesh is too great, you're disappointed in your spiritual growth, it's time to hear again the biblical conjunction. You, however, have the same power that has raised Christ from the dead. And besides, you learned a new Hebrew word today, right? That new Hebrew word, kabosh, subdue. So maybe when you're struggling, Maybe when the temptation is great, just say, kabosh, subdue, and follow it with, come, Holy Spirit, come and subdue my flesh in this moment that I might walk with you and you might continue your good work in me.